Seven. I'll take care of that on mine. Okay, so we've been talking about circuit breakers, breakers in a substation as far as line protection. And we know thus far that the breaker's purpose is to look for faults, recognize faults, recognize overcurrent, and is protecting both our overhead distribution circuits and the equipment and lines. And it's also uh, doing what? It's so fault current doesn't go where? To the ground. Well, fault current's gonna go to the ground, but we've got protection and think of the breaker. I've got in, in the substation, I've got input to the breaker, I've got output of the breaker. The output is off going out to the feeder. So I've got protection out there. If something occurs like a phase to ground or phase to phase fault, we want the breaker to operate. But where else do we not want that fault current to go? I'm going so, one way, I'm protecting my feeder. Where do we not want it to go? To back you want feeder. to go to the substation. Into the substation. Yes, sir. Okay. Once we start introducing fault current into the substation, and remember that substation transformer is a very, very expensive piece of equipment, we don't that, want that fault current to go any further. Now, if that fault current goes into the transformer, that's not a good thing. And also, now the transmission line is going to start getting involved because the transmission and the ACI is the next protective device. So now we're going to, there's plenty of them. We're going to talk about a couple of these today and have a quiz on these today. There's plenty of equipment that we have out there in the field to help sectionalize and isolate faults. But what, what do I mean by sectionalize and isolate? Um, separate from uh, the circuit. Yeah, you, you want to separate from your main feeder circuit. You want to be able to, if there's a fault in a location, you want to isolate it or sectionalize it. They're pretty much one and the same. And you want to take that fault condition away from your feeder circuit. So let me get a whiteboard going on up here. Share screen, whiteboard, share. It always does that. Draw. Share, share screen. Share. Okay, so everybody should have a whiteboard screen up here. It's up there. There we go. Movement. So I've got a breaker and a substation. I'll just call this breaker A. Then I go out of my feeder circuit, out of the breaker and the substation. The one that you're most familiar with right now is of course a fuse. And that's a symbol for a fuse, a little s. So let's say a bird flies into our line into here and gets into two phases at one time and causes a fault. What do we want the fuse to do? The uh, trip open. Well, blow. Blow. Okay. Yeah, there's no there's no technology or anything going on inside a fuse. It's just gonna blow if we have a fault, right? Gotcha. So it, it's blown. It's isolated, I'm gonna put a big open point right here. It's isolated these lines, but what about the rest of my feeder circuit? On or off? Uh -oh. It remains uh -huh. on, it remains on. And that's what we really want to have out there in the world. I've lost maybe, let's say just for number's sake, I've lost a hundred hundred customers here, but I still got 900 on, okay? So that's the purpose of fuses. They also, in, in some cases, now, when I have a single fuse blow, right, how many phases does that de-energize? One single fuse. One phase? One phase, okay, perfect. Obviously, if I have a three-phase tap line that comes out here, I'm gonna make this just three phases on a, on a tap is fused. If I have a fault on this one line, do all three phases blow? Just the one. Uh, no. No, it does not, okay? It's only gonna blow this one fuse right here. The other two are gonna remain on, okay? So 
used for specific situations. Fuses, I would have to say with Professor B, are the most dominant out there in the world as far as line isolation is concerned. We even do this. What about a transformer? Do we fuse a transformer? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. We fuse all our transformers too. Think of it. If I took that lead out of the transformer and went straight to the primary and didn't put any fuse in it, the animal gets up here, bang, uh, the transformer gets struck by lightning, just starts burning up. I'm going to take out the entire feeder circuit for the sake of one transformer. That's why we fuse all transformers. Okay. There's also a component, and it's rather new. Professor B's got some uh, good experience with it. And I'll bring up a share screen here to show you what they call a sectionalizer. Now, a sectionalizer has the same capabilities of a fuse, but they're used for certain uh, different purposes. So let me share the screen. screen one. Share. All right, so we're gonna look at a couple uh, different ones right here. Let me get this one correct. Utility. Delete that, enter. Okay, what they call a utility sectionalizer. Bring this up in a new tab. Okay. That looks like a pretty elaborate piece of equipment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yes, it does. You'll notice I, it's not fully visible in this picture, and I'll bring up a whiteboard for it. This sectionalizer is in line or in circuit with the feeder. So I'm not using a tap, uh, this for a tap line situation where I'm tapping off my feeder. I'm using this in conjunction with my feeder. And a sectionalizer, typically, most normal operations, opens all three phases. So if I have a fault on one phase, all three phases are going to open up. Okay, because that's because I'm on feeder circuit and we want to have some three phase protection going on there. All right, so you got in and then out. Sectionalizers are relatively uh, expensive right here. You also have, a, some of them have SCADA operation, remote operation. So that's all the cabling that you see here and that goes down to a radio down below. So that is a three phase sectionalizer. So let me go back to whiteboard. I'll give you an example of why we would want to use one of those. Back a couple of examples. Share. So let me clear. Can you all see that share? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you'll notice when you guys have been reading <clears throat> transformers and using those fuse barrels out there, Professor V, you might know one size higher. A fuse barrel. will only accommodate up to a 125 amp fuse. Right. Yeah, okay, good. I heard some companies say they can get a 150 in there. Really? Uh, the reason why it can only accommodate a 125 amp fuse is because of the, of the size of it, the rope size going down the barrel. You guys been, it, it just, that's all little fit in there. All right. There are situations that you're going to have out there in the world, especially with sectionalizers, that you can specify uh, 300 or 600. There are some out there that is as large as 900 amps per phase on a sectionalizer. I'm going to put three phase right here because that's what we're working at. All right, so I have the option here, I can protect a lot more stuff with these higher amperages. And two, just like I told you before, I've got it in typically in a feeder circuit. So here's my breaker. Now, here's a good scenario or situation where I'd work this. This is Conway. And this is Loris. 
Anybody know the distance? Pretty, pretty hefty distance, right? Probably 10 miles. Yeah, yeah 10, 12 miles. Good, good call. All right, I've got my feeder circuit that comes out here about midways. I've got an open point and then over here. So that's about five miles in between. So a good option right here, a lot of customers attached to this all down through here, up and off, is to go ahead and put a sectionalizer about halfway down these circuits. A fault occurs here, the sectionalizer is gonna open. Okay, and then all these people can remain on. That's two and a half miles of customers while these others are out. Same over here. Fault occurs down here. This sectionalizer is going to open. And all these customers can remain on in here. So pretty much what it says in the name of it, it's going to sectionalize areas so I can keep a lot of customers on, okay? Fuses would not be practical here because the load is too high beyond them. That's when I've got to upgrade to a sectionalizer. Now, a sectionalizer, and we'll get into this a little bit more, I don't call it, there are line reclosers. I don't call it a recloser, why? Yes, opens. Right. The sectionalizer does exactly what it name, <clears throat> the name says. I, it detects a fault, opens. That's it. It doesn't reclose. It sectionalizes. Does everybody understand that concept right there? All right. Why am I using a sectionalizer and not fuses? Because they hold more. The sectionalizer does? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. The load's too high beyond it. So I need something that's got more amperage capabilities, 300, 600, 900, depending on which one you buy, so it can carry the load. All right. Does it open one phase or all three phases? All three phases. All three phases, to, you know, Whatever one has the fault or two or three, doesn't matter. All three phases are gonna open. So that helps protect all my pre-phase equipment that's beyond that, okay? Two is, and it's a nice thing. I, I know Professor B's probably seen him. Uh, can I hook him up to SCADA? Mm -hmm. well, I think so. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can hook him up to SCADA too. So you actually get indication. I mean, I'm not gonna send a guy out in a pickup truck to drive five miles and say, uh, I can't tell where the fault's at. He says, it's beyond the sectionalizer. So now I've, I've narrowed down my patrol area to two and a half miles. Now, when the <laughs> sectionalizer opens, does the breaker open? I would imagine so. No, no. We don't want anything to happen here. We want this to remain okay. We, if the fault is beyond it, boom, right here. I want the sectionalizer to do all the work and all these yeah. customers prior to it to remain okay. So that's the purpose yeah. of a sectionalizer, okay? All right, so let me get over here to, not that, not that, and not that. But you, you did say it recloses, right? No. No, it doesn't recloses, okay. It, it sectionalizes, stays open. Detects a fault, opens. Does it's not closed. reclose. Yes, yeah, just think of the word itself. It takes out a section of line. Does not reclose. Okay, we'll talk about reclosers. <coughs> we'll talk about reclosers later. Okay. So let me double check this. All right. So that was a three-phase sectionalizer. How long do you think, uh, Professor V? I got a question for you. Yep. How long do you think uh, single phase sectionalizers have been out? Oh, gosh. We had them out probably back in 
It probably came out back into mid to late 90s. Mid to late 90s. Okay. So we started using it. All right. So somebody got smart here. And made a lot of money on this. Do you see the share screen? Got it. All right. And they st started making uh, sectionalizers for an individual phase. Now it looks just like a fuse barrel, doesn't it? Yeah. Except with all the electronics in it. Okay. Uh, this is what they call, and you get them in, in two different styles. You can get a two count sectionalizers, or you can get a one count sectionalizer. And they, they've got a purpose for each, each one of those things right there. Uh, what is it made out of? Uh, it, uh, it looks like all this, all this right here. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much copper tube, tubing, all right? You've got all the electronics wrapped up in this black device right here. Yeah. And there's a lot more in here than you think. Then they have here at the bottom what they call an actuator. Mm -hmm. So if I need to operate, that plunger fires out. Yeah. It looks like the tick tracer. Yeah, it does a little bit. It does. That plunger will fire out. It'll push the foot down and this mm -hmm. thing will fall open. Okay. I, I'm really surprised. I mean, there is a lot of technology wrapped up in these things and uh, they work rather well nowadays. Back in the old days, they were kind of hit and miss. Hit and miss. Okay. You so said that's called a what? It's a called, it's either a two, I don't know what the number is for this one. We'll, we'll teach on two and one, a two or one count single phase sectionalizer. Have you ever had to replace one of them? Uh, yeah, of course. Now they're, they're meant to operate multiple times. You can reset the foot right down here, but uh, yeah, you, you're gonna have to replace them every so often. Okay. Got it. All right. So. Uh, there's a question out there. Uh, what's the difference between a single phase and a three phase sectionalizer? And it's multiple choice. I'm not going to give the answer on that one. All right. You just asked this one and we just answered it. Sectionalizers have reclosing capabilities. Do they or do they not? <clears throat> they don't. Okay. They cannot reclose. They open, stay open. All right. So let's go back to this two count sectionalizer, because you guys are gonna to need to know how these things work, all right? Especially if you're working downstream from them. Let me get this up real quick. Uh, when do we use them? Once again, these will carry up to 300 amps. So uh, I have more capabilities than I do with a fuse. And when I say two count, you'll get into that in just a moment. Maybe I wanna give something in a situation out here where I want to something to count faults and then sectionalize it before the breaker opens. Now, when we talk breakers in my area, what was the norm? How many operations did we have? Operations. I had an I and what? You had an I and a T. Well, how many? Two. How many? How many T's? Two T's, right? Two T's, yeah. I had an I and two T operations. Okay, so what's total on that? Three. Three total. Three total operations. Mm -hmm. Let's scroll down here real quick. See if we can zoom in on a hole. Uh, that's not the one. I'm at Ocean Lakes. Ocean Lakes is a huge operation in uh, summertime. Get a little bit closer here. Perfect. All right, scroll up here. So this is one of three locations where I'm tapping off my feeder here at the top, coming down to a two count sectionalizer, and these go into Ocean Lakes. So that's one of three instances on Highway 17. Okay, gives a good example. The population of Ocean Lakes in the summertime, especially around July 4th, is larger than Surfside. So there's a lot of load in here. I, I can't put a fuse here. There's not a fuse big enough, but I still need some type of line isolation here. So I'm just gonna upgrade. These carry 300 amps a piece. 
And I want some different type of line protection, which we'll get into in just, just a moment as far as breaker operations. So that's a good example of where I would use a two count sectionalizer. High load, plus I want some kind of operations and that's where you hear two count come into the business. All right. You said After I, oh, go ahead. Uh, you said sectionalizers don't reclose. They do not. Okay. Once this, if this is, this is a single phase sectionalizer, once this actuator fires and this thing falls open, it's going to take a human to reset it and reclose it. Okay. Okay. Same on that three phase sectionalizer. It's going to take somebody, if you have SCADA, they can reclose it via SCADA, but it's just going to open. It's not going to reclose on its own automatically. So let me get a whiteboard going again. Stop share, share screen, whiteboard, share. So this, this gets a little, sorry about that. This gets a little texty, a little bit written stuff going on here. Sorry about that, clear all drawings. But you need to know how these things operate. First, we'll go with two count. All right, and there's a two CT or two count. And there, there is a reason why we're saying two and count in this situation. And it's the way fuses and sectionalizers and all our equipment work. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have my breaker. I'm going to have my feeder. And just like the picture that you saw, I'm going to go use one phase because that's all we need to do as far as the operation of how it works. Okay. I'm going to install a two count sectionalizer here. And then I'm going to go into Ocean Lakes. Okay. All right. So what the two count sectionalizer does, I want to put a fault here. Bang. All right. The two count sectionalizer one recognizes the fault in that little black box. Okay, that's the first thing it does. When I have a fault here, what does the breaker do? Okay. What's um, the first operation in my breaker? This is Tanius open. I open and then closes right back, right? Yes. Sir. Um, yes. Okay, when this when the eye open occurs, and I tell you, there's technology in here. The two count sectionalizer counts one loss of voltage. So this is pretty much in conjunction. The eye open, right? Took voltage off the line. The two count sectionalizer at the same time counted it, counts one loss of voltage. So right. when the brake closes again and then it counts the second one. Wait a second. Yeah, here we go. We get a little bit ahead of me. All right. Three, the fault is still, still here. Okay, I've got my clothes back. The fault is still there, so it recognizes the fault. What does the breaker do? What's my next operation? The eye opens again. Nope, eye's done. What's my next one? Uh, T. T, all right. T operation opens. And remember, T is going to wait because it's time. But that open right there, guess what the two count sectionalizer does? Counts it as the second one. Yeah, there you go. Count second loss of voltage. All right. After it counts the second loss of voltage, actuator fires. Okay. And when the actuator fires, it opens the switch.
That's it. Does everybody understand what I mean by actuator fires? I think so. Okay, and I'll go back to the picture. Let me unshare this. I'll come back to it. Stop share, share screen, screen one, share. Okay, in its normal operation, you got it up on the screen. In the normal operation, this thing's sitting straight up just like this in the switch. Okay. So fault occurs down line, breaker instantaneous, this counts one. I lost voltage one time. And it also recognize the fault current going through it. My power goes back on, fault occurs, it recognizes it. Breaker goes into timed operation. So that's my second loss of voltage. It's got stored energy here, that little plunger right at the bottom. See if I can make this. Here we go. Get super big on it. That plunger fires out, kicks the foot. This is the foot of the switch in the bottom of the switch, kicks the foot down, and the barrel falls open. Now, the nice thing about it is I'm in timed operation. So the does the barrel fall open when I have voltage or not? Not. Not, right. So it falls open when there is no voltage or current on the line so it doesn't draw an arc, all right? What's my last operation? Um, it recloses back, guess what? I'll go back to my right, white screen right here. Share screen, whiteboard, share. All right, so we've got, uh, what do you got? The second T. Right. Okay, so we've got down to five. My actuator fired, then it opened the switch, All right? Does the breaker recognize any fault anymore? <clears throat> My switch is open now. Does the breaker recognize any fault? No, because there's no fault. Right, right. My actuator fired. The switch is open. So I don't need to go to my third T target. Okay. It recloses. Uh, okay. And all of a sudden, everything's okay. So you see one, two counts. IT, got an IT count. Recloses, breaker's okay, and I've sectionalized. That's why I call it a two-count sectionalizer. I've sectionalized this portion of, of fault location. In essence, instead of one chance with a fuse, I've given it two chances for whatever's on this line to fall away, right? Plus, I have the capability of going higher in amperage. That's a 300 amp to count sexualizer. Okay, so that understood, does everybody know this process right here? Because you're gonna to need to know how a two count works in a question. Okay, good to go. All right, there are also out there in the world, one count sexualizers. Now what does a one count sexualizer do? The same thing, but it clo uh, it actuates after the first loss of voltage. Right, right. It's essentially, depending on the scheme of your company, it's essentially a fuse, but I can't put a fuse there because I need to go high in amperage. All right, it counts one time, the open close, then fires the foot. Fault is isolated, fires the actuator. Basically like a high amp fuse. In one count situations, yes. Oh, okay. In one count, yes. In two count, I have, I have now added the uh, capability of giving, instead of one chance for this fault to go away, in two count, I've given it two chances. Gotcha. Okay, good deal. All right, what time are we over here? 10.24. All right. Everybody square on how a one 
and two count sectionalizer works. Okay. Here, this is a two counts. Excuse. Uh, uh, so let's we'll start on this, and we'll probably take a break in into it. Images. All right. So you guys have fused some of our switches out there at the field, and you know what fuses are. I look about right. Yeah. 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 Yep. Right. Okay. So you notice here, and this is probably a lower amperage fuse. You notice that this braid of rope Female. can fit through a fuse barrel rather easily. You get above 125, that braid is huge and it won't fit through a fuse barrel. So I have to use mm -hmm. other options. Okay. The fuse itself is encapsulated right about down in here. All right, and there's a purpose for this cardboard sheathing that's over the top. It's supposed to help in the uh, dispersion of heat and uh, matter if, if one blows. And inside the cap right here, you'll also see in fine printing, they've also had the fuse size there and they've got the fuse size here also, just in case you don't have it in the box. Okay, on a fuse blow, the only thing that typically survives is this part right here. That's a steel spring. All right, so let's go and see if we can find different types. So Professor V, let, let me know if you've used, we used K and KS. Yes. Okay. This is a, can hardly tell. That's a K. All right. Mm -hmm. You're going to have different types of fuses when you work out there in the world. And normally, we only had two types. K stands for fast blow. KS stands for slow. Blow. K slow. K slow blow. And it depends on what kind of scheme that you're running. Like I said before, out there, as far as your uh, feeder circuits and your fusing is concerned. We'll talk about two, two different schemes here in just a moment, but know the different types, K, fast, KS, slow. What, do I, what am I referring to as fast and slow? What am I returning to, referring to? Speed of how fast the fuse blows. Exactly, all right. Does it a fast blowing fuse? Is it a slow blowing fuse? Does it kind of give maybe a couple cycles in there before it finally decides to blow, All right? It has nothing to do with the 150%. That, that's where people kind of get misconstrued. If I got a 10 F fuse, what will it do? 15, okay? That's got, that 150% has nothing to do with the speed of which it will blow in a fault situation. K fast, KS slow, all right? And I will tell it, I'll tell the two different situations of why we use those out here in the world after we take a break. It is 1028. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and say 1045. Let's go ahead and take a break here and be back at 1045. Okay, so we determined earlier the K and KS fuses, which is the most dominant. There are more types of fuses that are out there, fuse types. Ooh, uh, wow. Super fast super slow, but K and KS are the typical ones you're gonna see out there in the world. Uh, K fuse is normal blowing speed, KS is a little bit faster speed. So we know what we're talking about there. Uh, certain companies also, and uh, Robbie, you keep me advised of how Duke does this here, have different types of fuse schemes. Correct. So it's actually how the fuse and how they fuse on their circuits in relation to the breaker, okay? So we're gonna go through both scenarios here, the fuse saving scheme and the fuse blowing scheme. The fuse saving scheme is, and I'm just draw it up here as a fault on, I've got a fault that happens on my tap line 
beyond the fuse? What's the first operation that I have? Uh, eye. Eye target. So the breaker opened and instantaneously reclosed. To be honest with you, that eye target saved the fuse one time. On that open and close, I gave the fault an opportunity, even though as short as it was, to clear itself and the fuse did not blow. Now, obviously we know from doing this before, if the, fuse, if the fault remains there after the close, then I'm gonna go into T-targets. The first T-target I get right here, the fuse will blow. On reclose, exclude that one. Fuse will blow on reclose. But essentially, I mean, fuse saving scheme, first target is instantaneous. I saved the fuse for one open close. All right, I'll, I'll see if you guys put your minds to work here. Fuse blowing scheme. What is my first target? First Jeez. operation, timed. All right, it's a timed close, not a reclose. It stays closed for a certain amount of time. When I say time, not like 10 or 15 minutes. Instead of three to five cycles, it might be one full 60 hertz cycle. 60 cycles, maybe 120. It's gonna wait a certain amount of time, time closed wait. What's the fuse gonna do? Instantaneously blow. It's gonna blow on the time. It's sensing fault current. The breaker's not doing anything. It's not opening or closing. It's waiting. It's on a time closed wait. The fuse is going to blow. I can't stand any more of this high current going through me. Does the breaker open or close? No. No. Instantaneous, yes. Timed wait close, no. That's a fuse blowing scheme. First operation, timed close wait. That's fuse blowing. First operation in fuse saving, instantaneous. That's the meat and potatoes of that. All right. Robbie, what'd you use on Duke system? Combination. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. We use the combination of that too, and we'll get to that in just a moment. All of our overhead circuits, and let me know if you were different here, all of our overhead circuits were fuse saving schemes, overhead. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'd have one instant instantaneous operation on the breaker. And then uh, if the fault remained, the fuse would blow. Now on underground, some portions of underground, we did fuse blowing. What about y'all? Yes, all underground was like that. Okay, good deal. All right, mm -hmm. so let me uh, see if we can find out why. All right. I'm glad we're on the same page as that one, or Duke's on the same page as us. I've lost oh, yeah. my mouse. Can, while, we're, while I'm getting this cleared off, can anybody give me any indication why in, if I have a circuit that's mostly, that's mostly underground, why I would have a fuse blowing scheme? To protect everything else that would uh, be after that fuse? Actually, when I have a fault, it stays timed. It's going to fault out for a little bit longer. So that, that's not going to help me. Both the I and T, both the fuse saving and fuse balloon schemes, isolate. It's got something to do with geographic location. Overhead is overhead, and underground is underground. Well, I mean... Oh, because you can't see the underground. Uh, true. All right, so I've got my... I've got a pole here. i got my overhead line. got another pole. got another overhead line. 
And let's just say a big old egret flies into it. Cluster, 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 and the egret falls to the ground. That's a good situation where I might want to use fuse saving. Let's put my fuse down here. A fuse going into it. Fuse saving. Because whatever hit the line down here fell away, right? And I have all my power back on, not only the feeder, but the tap line too. Let's go underground. And you remember this from what we had out there in the field. I'll put my open point over here. This is fused on the underground part. I have a fault between here and here. What's the difference in the characteristics of this fault and this fault? The fault that's underground will still continue to fault. Exactly. Exactly. You said it 100%. Underground faults are permanent. I've never seen a self-healing underground fault. Have you, Professor? Reed? No. No. Underground faults are permanent. So if I go to fuse blowing here, in a predominantly underground situation, off my breaker, nobody will see that open close that you have up here. Nobody will see an instantaneous target in fuse flowing scheme. It'll just blow the fuse and the rest of my circuit, <coughs> nobody will know the difference. <coughs> and that's a great example. Underground faults are permanent, gentlemen. Overhead faults have a tendency to sometimes clear themselves. Exactly. Okay. Good answer, Professor. I mean, uh, Mr. Ebert. All right. Let's see where we're at on this quiz. Oh, who specifies whether it's a fuse saving or a fuse blowing scheme? Who in the company does that? Engineers. Thank you. <laughs> Got that cleared up quick. Yeah, really, really fast. Too. All right. Don't use that one again, Lenny. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So we got we're gonna go do a couple of uh, safety things here. Let me show video. Oh my goodness! This the phone just won't stop today. Share screen. Screen one. Share. Let me know when you got two guys in a bucket truck. Yep. Okay. This is part of a safety thing, and really it relates to positioning of people and what not to do when you're closing fuses. I'm ready. Sure, yeah. Okay, so just to give you guys a heads up, do you see the guy standing in the bucket anymore? No. No, he's calling what we, we typically call it eating his knees. All right. And when you, if something happens up in a pole, you eat your knees. You just get down in the bucket and you go down there. Look, guys, the bucket operates. Just rotate the bucket out of the way. Yeah. All right. Watch what happens here. Hmm. I don't know if he's saying move the bucket or get the bucket out of the way. I can't make out what he's saying, but this guy just seems to think, well, it's okay if I just hang out here. Check your rotation. Sign a blowing arrestor. One, two. Closed. Blew up on it last time. Okay. That didn't work too well, did it? Nope. Pretty much uh, freaked out the guy at the bottom, too, right? Yeah, let's that kind of shifted. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's see how let's see how close we can get this to where he closes it. He's right at it right there. Okay, there, that, that's pretty good in the explosion.
Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty right there. All right. So that gives you a good indication of what happens when a fuse blows. Pretty much all of the fuse is vaporized. And this is what it's meant to do. It's meant to exhaust out of the bottom of the barrel. This is all molten metal and heat right here. Uh, what piece do you, of this fuse do you think survives? When I showed you that fuse before. Tubing and the tubing and the, uh, oh, and then. Uh, oh, just uh, the end of it there. The yeah, steel, that little, yeah, that little steel, tail will survive. Spring. Remember that steel spring that's up in here? Yeah. All right, usually that survives. The rest of it's made of a uh, much lighter metal. That steel spring will fly down and will embed in you. And it is nuclear hot. It's as hot as the sun. So where do you stand when somebody is closing fuses? Off to the side of it? Or yeah, don't or stand underneath it. it. <laughs> right. Do not stand <laughs> underneath. And guys, this goes from here all the way down to the ground. If you got people on the ground standing around out here or vehicles, try to get them moved. Don't stand around down here where this thing's going to explode and it's going to blow out all this material down upon you. Uh, I don't know, Robbie. What size stick do you think that is? I can't see it. My um, screen's froze up. Okay. That looks like it might possibly be a six, six or eight foot, foot stick. Uh, you, oh, 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 and this comes along to Duke Energy's practices. Robbie, what I've got here is I've got a guy in a bucket truck with a stick closing a fuse. Yep. What's your practices at Duke as far as closing fuses? From the ground. If he, anything all field like transformers or anything like that, you have to close them in from the ground. You can't do it out of the bucket. Nice. Mr. Schumacher. What's up? Wouldn't it be better if they designed that thing with, with uh, you know, shooting upward instead of downward, you know, because of, of it uh, potentially damaging the, the transformer? Or the connection. It, 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 this right here, it would take, I know it would take, probably take a little time. You need to have a closed cap at the top. Otherwise, you're going to fill this full of water and debris. Mm. We I actually had you. some, we, we had some barrels like that one time, and the, the, um, the very top of it had what they called an expendable cap. Mm -hmm. And the cap would actually blow out and it would explode out of the top. Okay. There's mm -hmm. your answer. Uh, but this gives you guys good indication, really, on why Duke has this policy. Uh, that's close. You see my mouse going right through here? I mean, you can see his face. His face is entirely lit up. Yep. The explosion was pretty substantial. That, that's too close. I'd, I'd definitely be using a 10-foot stick here or following what uh, Duke's energy rules are and that is too close from the ground. All right, that sound is pretty substantial too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> You're gonna make a career out of closing fuses like this. I, I can't even count in my head how many times I've blown a fuse closing it on something. Oh my and it's yeah. one of those, it's one of those things is you don't know you're damaging your ears until it's happened multiple times. Okay. So when you're doing stuff like this, you need to be wearing ear protection. I can't tell if they've got it or not. Wear ear protection when you're closing fuses. Holy fuck. Oh, didn't mean that that to come on. Okay. Right, any questions there? That's a great example. Let me see. Let me go yeah. back here one more. There's another one. All right, here we go. Kind of lower quality, but a good video. So these guys are using extension sticks. Beauty. Beauty. Slow mo. And you can tell. 
anything, and the guy was walking down here with his truck, anything that's down below this expulsion right here, it's just getting pelleted. Okay? It's a lot of exhaust coming out of the bottom of that barrel. Now they do something here that's kind of a head scratcher. He's doing this from the ground. It sounds a little windy. All right, he's replacing the fuse. Good old Billy Bob. Looks like now I'm another guy. All right, so he hangs it back up. That wind's kicking. Closed and holding. Y'all saw what happens there? How do I tell you guys to close the switch? Slam it home. Very Get it quick. home. And two, what about this? Put it under the ring. Put it under the ring. Okay, especially, I mean, he kind of babies this thing into the switch. That wind catches that stick. It's going to pull that thing right back open. Follow your company's policy. You know I go under it. He kind of babies it in there. And he has to... Actually, push it again. Watch. Now it's locked in. Here we go. That's pretty good on the aim. Okay, so I would probably get talked to at this time and why would i why would my supervisor be talking to me about something i was doing wrong you didn't you didn't test yeah if there's a fault on the circuit that's blowing a fuse it's going to remain there until you fix it all right, so you, you've got to go out. You've got to patrol. You've got to find something. Something's wrong. You've got to find something's wrong and fix it. You're not, and Professor B, back me up on this. You're just not allowed to pound fuses to it all the time. And that's what that's they're right. doing. Fuse after fuse after fuse after fuse. Nah, especially blown, yeah. find <laughs> the problem, repair it, then replace the fuse. Now, if right. this is a fuse saving scheme, What's happened to everybody that's on the circuit? They see it. On off. On off. On off. Oh, on off. Beauty. Okay. So you're disrupting them too. Oh, beauty. And so uh, Jimbo here is thinking, oh man, do you think we ought to just ride it out and see if there's something wrong? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Has there been instances where a fuse blow has blown uh, without it being a fault? That's not possible, correct? No, there's got to be some kind of fault happening out there. I've seen the cases, Lenny, where I've closed a fuse so hard and it's broken. Got it. It's broken in the tube because I really went with it too hard, but that uh, it won't make an explosion. Right. It just falls out of the tube. It would draw an arc, but it just falls out of the tube. Uh, those are in cases where I know I'm picking up a lot of load. Okay, so let me stop this share. Let's see where we stand. All right, if you explain fuse blowing, or where do you not stand? KS speed. Okay, all right, last but not least. I'm gonna put your minds to work here. You should have a white screen up here. Nope. You do not? I do not. Does everybody else have a whiteboard up? Yeah, I see it. All right. Bobby, get your stuff fixed over there. Okay. Fixing the call surge again. <laughs> Here's my breaker. 
Here's my feeder line. Here's my tap line. Let's talk safety here just a little bit. I got my little bucket truck here. I'm looking for the sky down. Here's my truck. Not a good truck drawer. Wheels. Okay. For safety's purposes, what do I need to obtain on this circuit for safety purposes? Mm. Do I want the breaker to open and close normally? No. No, you just had it on your last quiz. So what do I need to get on this entire circuit before I start work? Oh, um, I'm sorry. You need to get a, um, what do you call it? Damn. Hotline. There you go. Yeah. You get a hotline work permit or a hotline tag as they do to Duke Energy. So I'm working on my circuit. Now, when I've got a hotline work permit or a hotline tag, the <clears throat> breaker will open and not reclose, right? That's what we wanted to do. So I'm working along and along here and I just hung my brand new transformer on the pole and I get ready to close the fuse to the transformer. What do I need to do? I'm getting ready to close the fuse on a brand new transformer. Make sure it's grounded. If I ground the transformer, there'll be a massive explosion. But what do I need to do as far as my circuitry is concerned before I close a fuse? <coughs> you got to reclose the breaker. Breaker never did open. But I do have a hotline work permit on it. Let me back up and ask you a different question. If I close the fuse here, do I want the fuse to act normally and do its job? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Even if there's a fault, I still want the fuse to do what it's supposed to do. Will the fuse do? what it's supposed to do when I've got a hotline work permit. Yeah. No, because it won't close? No, it no, won't blow. Yeah. It will take the breaker out. If there's a fault in my transformer, bang, it'll take the breaker out, the fuse will be okay. So what do I need to do prior to closing, and not only is transformer fuse, any fuses when I have a hotline work permit or hotline tag. What was it, Nigel? No, never mind. Never mind. Okay. Open so up. we determine, I want the fuse to do its job. Yes, that's good. When I have a hotline work permit, I don't allow it. Yeah. No, right. no, see. Breaker's going to see the fault. It's going to go through the fuse. Breaker's going to see the fault, but it's just going to open. You got to close the breaker. It never, it never opened in the first place. I've only got a hotline work permit. So just get rid of it. Get rid of what? You got to make sure you... The hotline get rid of the hotline. Exactly, exactly, gentlemen. <laughs> if I want this off. fuse to do its job, I need it to run in its normal mode of operation. So I'm using a stick, correct? Either from a ground or 10 feet away. I don't need the hotline work permit. You got to cancel your hotline work permit. Close fuse. Okay. If there's a fault in the transformer, you're going to get an open and close immediately, and it's going to blow the fuse. This is like normal everyday operation. 
If I did not give up my hotline work permit, I'm going to close the fuse. Every single customer on this feeder is going to be out for a long amount of time just because you didn't give up your hotline work permit. Okay. So when closing fuses, cancel your hotline work permit. Now, if you need to get it back, you just call them back and say, hey, I need to do some more work here. Can I get my hotline work permit back? Sure. After the fuse is closed. All right. I use a transformer in this situation. All situations where you're closing fuses and you have a hotline work permit on the feeder circuit, when you have a hotline work permit on the feeder circuit, you've got to cancel that hotline work permit. Okay? Okay. All right, Robbie, you there? I'm here. All right, stand by one. I got Mr. Granger in here. I'm going to go to mute. Okay. All right. Sorry, I have to get you like this. I'm about to go. Give it a break. Let's go ahead and take 15 minutes. If you could, gentlemen, you could, gentlemen, just stand by for a moment. That's yes, uh, what's the difference between a single phase and a three phase sectionalizer? That's multiple choice. True or false, sectionalizers have reclosing capabilities. True or false. List the steps of how a two count sectionalizer works. Two count. Okay, and those are the ones I wrote out on the whiteboard for you. And that's written answer. All right, guys, that's worth 40 points. So make sure you watch the video and get that down right. Explain a few savings. <coughs> That's 10 points. Explain a few saving. Uh, explain fuse blowing. That's written. Where do you not stand when somebody is closing a fuse? <clears throat> a KS fuse blows. And this is asked for speed, fast or slow. Multiple choice. What must you do before closing a fuse? And then we just discussed it. All right. What's the policy for closing fuses at Duke Energy? Professor V's statement right there. Last but not least, what additional safety, additional capitalized, bolded, and italicized safety gear shall be worn while closing fuses. It is unique to fuses that may blow. And you've got a multiple choice answer there. Questions? Yeah, 